Thanks for joining us here on the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. As I'm sure you read in the title of this episode, I'm about to have the pleasure of hearing from you about where I've gotten it wrong in our weekly Clark Stinks segment. I think I have too much fun with it, but you can be the judge. Also in today's show, something far more serious and not something that's a laughing matter. Aretha Franklin's death has something in it that all of us can learn from. And now, Krista, it is time for me to hear where I have messed up. Right. I usually know others will write in and say you stink on the items I'm concerned about. This time, I am so upset I am ready to yell. Mr. Howard. Oh, oh, oh. You said some people treat money as a god, and they should not do that. They should spend their money and enjoy experiences. Clark, look in the mirror. You took your three kids to Paris and then proceeded to not pay for them to ride the elevator to the top of the Eiffel Tower. What an experience you missed. You can redeem yourself. Please take your entire family back to Paris and have a do-over. Ride the elevator and enjoy the, ex- enjoy the experience and your blessings, Clark. Joanne. Joanne, do you know you're one of how many, I don't even know how many people, Rodan Clark Stinks, who were so upset with me that I took my three kids all the way to Paris and made them walk the stairs to, is it, stairs only go to, is it level, yep. whatever, mm-hmm. and wouldn't lay out the additional money for them to go up the elevator. My only rebuttal to that is my three kids, remember, that was 2012, and they remember it like it happened yesterday, <laughs> and we talk about it. Remember the time you wouldn't let us ride the elevator up the Eiffel Tower? So, I wonder what age they all discovered that the dollar store was not the toy store. Because I remember you used to tell them, we're going to go to the toy store. <laughs> you yeah. go to the dollar store. So I used to, uh, when the kids were each young, and it's like I have three only kids because of their age separation, but they would each be able to buy two things at Dollar Tree when Dollar Tree lived by its name and it was a dollar, not a dollar twenty-five tree. Anyway, um, yeah, it was funny as they reached the point in different ages for each of them when they realized that wasn't actually the toy store. And all three of them grew up in a time where there was this place that was uh, really, really, really expensive called Toys Toys R Us. Us. They never graced the the halls of Toys R Us on my watch. (laughs) All right. Clark doesn't stink, but I thought he would correct a minor comment he recently made. He said he thought New York City may be the largest office market in the world. It is typically... Midtown is in the top five office markets in the world. It is typically beat out by Beijing and London. I'm a commercial real estate broker in Texas, and I specialize in office investment sales. Also, in the same episode, there was a question about alternatives to self-storage. And you mentioned storing things at a friend's place. A coworker of mine was storing possessions for a friend who took a cross-country bike ride to raise money for a cause. Unfortunately, my coworker and his wife were clearing out their storage area and accidentally loaded up their friend's belongings and donated them. My coworker went out and replaced everything. <laughs> Word of caution, if you store your stuff with someone or if you're storing stuff for someone, Robin. Wow, wow, wow. Doing a good deed for a friend and then reversing that good deed by giving their stuff away? And then you have to buy them new stuff. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, that's very interesting that Beijing and London are both bigger office markets than New York. I was not aware of that. You know, before too long, Singapore will probably be the world's largest office market. Even when you screw up, you don't stink. 
your halfway good advice is usually better than any other advice you get on a podcast. Oh, man. <laughs> you recently told a listener to return recalled food to a retailer and advise the clerk that it's recalled so it doesn't get put back on the shelf. At most big box retailers, the staff is large, often inexperienced, and sometimes poorly motivated. The chances of that item getting back on the shelf is pretty high. I recommend taking a big Sharpie and writing recalled in big letters across the front of the package. That will help ensure no one ends up eating a tainted food product, Brian. Brian, that is a great suggestion. Love it. We had a few people write in, not with that suggestion, but about that, like that that the food, no matter what you say to the person it returns, it's right. going back on the shelf. Okay. You know the worst I've seen in supermarkets? What? You know how they'll have to send somebody around because people will abandon items while they're shopping? And you'll see something that's a frozen or refrigerated item, and it's going right back in the freezer or, or refrigerated case. Uh, but the big thing here is on you and me. If you put something in your shopping cart, or if you live in a part of the country, they call them buggies. You put something in your buggy, and you decide you don't want it, don't just lay it down somewhere. Take it back to where you got it from, because you're protecting that next person, particularly if the item is a refrigerated or frozen item. Clark only smells like the breath of someone who ate very garlicky chicken Alfredo. Not horrible, but not great. When Clark responded to a listener's question about Timu, I think is how we decided it said, with a moderately positive answer, he left out the fact that Timu has a horrible rating on the BBB website, two out of five stars, and that it's considered to be a relatively sketchy app when it comes to privacy. Please make sure your listeners know that there's a decent amount of risk that you will end up having to deal with not receiving the product you order. If this, if it seems that Timu usually makes things right, but who wants to have to deal with filing a dispute when they don't have to just have to just because they ordered something that looked good trying to save a buck or 10 and they never get the item what a hassle judy and judy, people were also wrote in that they've had major child law labor complaints there's there's a lot going on with timu the prices are crazy low have you looked at it mm -mm. i mean the prices are incredibly low you also will be spammed you know i i don't know if you remember this. Someone had asked about Timu, and I said I'd sign up for mm -hmm. it and try it and see what it was like. And did I just get another Timu? No, that wasn't Timu. I, but I got texts all day long from mm -hmm. Timu. And they spam. Do you call it spam when it's a text message? Sure. A spam text. They send me spam texts all hours of the day and night. And I found so far, I did three orders, which is what I like to do when I test something out. And all three orders came in as said, the merchandise was as represented, and the prices were crazy low. Lots of questions if you've got, um, you know, child labor, you have people in, what's the province in China where you're not supposed to buy things from because it's people that are... Mm, I and, didn't know about and that. Work camps. Mm. Um, and work camps. So anyway, there there are question marks about it. And so far, I haven't had any issue. I haven't ordered again from them of those three orders. So I, I guess I'd have to order a few more times and see if I have things that don't come or come in not as represented and see what the experience is like. But I appreciate all the feedback on it because... It is such a an unusual site, and it's the fastest growing app download, I think, in the United States right now. Wow. You sting like the southbound end of a northbound skunk. You s discuss the cartels of companies like MasterCard and Visa and their transaction fees. What you always fail to mention is what comes out of those fees. Innovation in payments, tokenization, identity theft protection, small business investment incubators, and undeveloped, underdeveloped companies countries, global jobs, and more. That reinvestment will be the backbone of the future of our economy, Tim. Tim, I appreciate that perspective. There was also a perspective recently about how people who love rewards on cards are the ones that are the most unhappy about the Visa MasterCard cartel fees being uh, forced down. 
And so, uh, obviously, the banks and Visa and MasterCard make massive profits from us having the highest fees in the world on using credit cards. And there is some benefit that ends up coming to some of us, like I totally play the cash back game. Um, so I am benefiting, the merchants are suffering, and people who pay cash are subsidizing us. People who use credit cards and run interest charges on them are subsidizing those of us who have rewards. So it's not all one thing because those extremely high fees do come back to some of us in benefits. Don't use your Sam's cash to pay for items at Sam's. Get the cash at customer service. That way, when you check out, you will get the 5% cash back for using your club credit card, and you're a plus member when you check out. Greg. Greg, thank you. And uh, you are not the first person who said that. And so if the line is short at the service desk and you see in your app that you have some Sam's cash there, you're 100% right. On the other hand, particularly on the weekend, if the line at the customer service desk is long, hold on to the cash longer before you go stand in that line to get your cash. But uh, the, what you're saying is 100% true because if you use it to pay for items at the store, you're losing the rewards that you're getting that are so generous as a plus member using the Sam's MasterCard to buy merchandise. Clark, you stink worse than my company's garbage compactor on a 100-degree day on this one. Okay, let me stop you. I love the creativity <laughs> people have in describing how much I stink. Do you have a particular favorite, people said? No. Okay. No. I, this one is pretty creative. No, but I love all these phrases. Go ahead. <laughs> Honestly, I don't mean that, but this one has the potential to destroy someone financially. I've heard you time and time again tell people not to take the insurance at the rental car counter if your credit card offers coverage when paying for the rental with it. However, all the cards I have, including your famed Costco Visa's coverage, clearly states online, which took me a while to find, that only damage to the rental car is covered. Nothing else, including anything else you may damage or medical bills for those injured, is covered, which really makes the coverage useless. Mike from Wisconsin and P.S. Keep on keeping, guys. Love you. Mike, we uh, love you too, Mike. Mike, thank you very much, and um, hope you get some... Uh, cheese curds and some good custard today, in my honor. Anyway, everything for me, everywhere I go is about the food, right? Yep, for sure. <laughs> so you bring up a really valid point that what you're avoiding by not buying all the pseudo insurance from the car rental counter and then using a credit card in its place, what you're really getting is it's covering damage to the vehicle. Uh, liability, if you injure someone, all that that's still going back on your own automobile insurance. And that's true whether the card you're using is primary coverage or secondary. Primary and secondary is for damage to the vehicle. And so that's why we have auto insurance, is that if we were in our own vehicle and somebody was injured and went after us on the liability side, it's the same thing. You don't have to buy it from the car rental company. So your point is completely valid it doesn't change my answer, though, because your auto insurance is there for those purposes. And speaking of rental cars, a few people wrote in about this one. Clark's a little bit smelly on his advice for, advice for a listener to continue driving a rental car long distances beyond the recommended oil change. The car belongs to someone else, the rental company, and a renter should at least try to see if the owner wants to have the change done. On a recent rental where I drove several hundred miles, the maintenance required light came on. Even though it was a Toyota and I checked the oil level, I called the rental company to see what they would like. They asked me to turn the car in at the nearest agency where they swapped out a different car for me, even though I was in a different town. I was happy to do my part in keeping a fleet of hardworking cars on the road, Chris. Chris, thank you. Wow, what a great suggestion. And that had never occurred to me. That is wonderful if you're driving a car for an extended period of time, driving a lot of miles, and it comes up that it's time for an oil change. Doing just what you said is such a great idea. You call the rental agency and say, what do you want me to do? They gave you a perfect, nearly painless answer, and you protected 
the money they have tied up in the car. I love that. Okay, last two are both about your favorite topic, football. Okay? It's just not my favorite topic. Football is my life. I know. Clark? Boy, do you keep missing the mark on the NFL Sunday ticket. It saves a lot of money, even at $349. Why? Because your team is out of mar- if your team is out of market and not on regular TV, what do you do? You go somewhere to watch. My husband and I used, used to spend a minimum of $100 each week because both of our teams are out of market. My poor Redskins are never on TV, and yes, there's a bag over my head. <laughs> At 18 weeks, that is $1,800, and most times our bill was over $100. For the last two years, we've enjoyed the game at home, going out only when we bo- both of our teams are on at the same time. He's a Patriots fan. First year, we saved over $1,000, and last year, even more because of the schedule. Longtime loyal listener that met you on a President Carter project build back in 2005. Thanks for all the Habitat families. Angel. Angel. Mm-hmm. Your name is perfect because if you're volunteering with Habitat for Humanity, that organization means so much to me and to my heart. Okay. So for me, okay. oh, I can't. Well, I was going to read the second one. Oh, first read too. the second one, please. Every time I hear Clark talk about his love for NFL, it inspires me as I too have a love of football, college football, that is so much so that I don't work ever on Saturdays. I watch the pregame shows from 5 a.m. California time until the last college football game of the day or sports center is done around 11 p.m. on the West Coast. Why is Clark paying so much for NFL Sunday ticket? The absolute best way to watch the NFL is NFL Red Zone on Sundays. No commercials and seven hours of commercial-free football. I would think that Clark Howard, being who he is, would love to be invited into the Red Zone broadcast booth for seven hours of football watching every game Red Zone shows, the hi- the highlights and cuts to all the best games and scoring plays. It is awesome, Clark. Tim. Tim, okay. Uh, which order? I'll, I'll answer Tim first. Okay. Since he was the one you mentioned most recently. So, Tim... I do watch college football, too. I just don't get that same emotional connection as I do to the NFL. Um, So red zone. I've never been someone who just likes watching the highlights. I like being with a game, even a bad NFL game, through the game. And so that's why I have multiple TVs going at once where I can – watch and get the flow of a game through the game. Um, So red zone wouldn't work for me. And the other thing is, I know this is weird. You get up 5 a.m., you're watching the pregame stuff on ESPN and all that till the last game ends. I never watch any of the sports talk shows on ESPN or anywhere else. I don't listen to sports talk on radio, none of that is my thing. I just enjoy the games themselves. So I guess that makes me an oddball for being such a big fan. Now, Angel, guys, say something to you. I don't drink. So if I went to a sports bar to watch the games from out of market on the big screen TVs, they would get like the cost of one Coke Zero from me. Not even an appetizer. I mean, like, I I wouldn't cost myself anything (laughs) doing that. And so, um, since it's a real advantage to not drinking, you know, Mm -hmm. that you don't spend that money. And uh, as we've shared several times recently, uh, Krista was in Europe with her family in one part of Europe. I was in another part of Europe with part of my family. And what happened over and over again, beer is cheaper than soft drinks and water a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So I was drinking local beer. (laughs) Save money. Because it was the cheapest beverage. It was funny because you'd look on the menu and uh, soft drink might be $8 equivalent in U.S. dollars. And the beer would be like two dollars or two and a half dollars. So which do you think I had? Beer. Beer, no doubt. And other than a situation like that, I don't drink at all. There's something wrong with me. The, 
Anyway, there's probably a lot wrong with me. Coming up ahead, I want to talk about something we need to do right for our families, for the people we love, that all too many of us put this on ignore. The Aretha Franklin saga that's gone on is something you think, oh, that's just a celebrity. Even if you loved her music, her entertainment skill and all that. But there's something so valuable for you and me. The story of her supposedly dying without a will, then recently, no joke, a will was supposedly found in her sofa cushions. I'm not kidding. Now the courts are trying to decide if that's the, the proper will and all that. You may have heard some of that. Don't make it so hard on the people you love. Overwhelmingly, people who should have a will don't have one. Like the most common answer I'll hear from people, particularly people who are, uh, have not been married a long time, maybe have a kid or two, you're like, I don't have anything. Why would I do a will? If you've got a kid or two, or three, or whatever, that's why you do a will. Absolutely. That is a moment in your life that you need a will. Because if you don't have a will, the state decides who raises your kids. The state decides. No, 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 no. You want to make those decisions. Imagine the state decides that your nightmare sister or brother or nightmare brother-in-law or sister-in-law or some other family member who you're like, well, glad that family reunion's over. We don't have to see that person for fill-in-the-blank time. And that's the person the state decides is going to raise your kids? You do that will for your kids. If you don't have a lot of assets, you can do one of those... Um, Software wills. Willmaker is the most popular of all those, if you will. Um, if you have a pretty simple financial inst situation, you just want to protect your spouse or so often people are living with someone they're not married to, you want to protect that person, you want to have a will that says what you want to have happen. Uh, one thing I got to tell you, though, Beneficiary designations on bank accounts, insurance policies, brokerage accounts, all that, they are those beneficiary designations you do, they are superior to what's in a will. Most common situation with that, somebody gets divorced. And they forget. They didn't make their new significant other or their kids or their new spouse the beneficiary, and you pass away, and the stuff goes to who? The ex-spouse that you would put as the beneficiary designation. This is stuff to pay attention to. On the other hand, you have extensive assets, or you have a complicated family situation, blended family, anything like that. You own a business. You need a lawyer to do a will, and not just any old lawyer, a lawyer who what he or she does is their specialty of law, wills, estates, and trusts. And depending on how complicated your situation is, you may need something very simple that's pretty inexpensive, or you may need something that is pretty complicated and must be nurtured, managed over time. At the very least, every significant birthday, just use a significant birthday so you remember 
because otherwise people don't remember that they did that will long ago and lots of things have happened. New babies born or something like that. Something that's a milestone in your life. You get married, you get divorced, something like that. You want to check that will and see if it needs updating. At the least, every five years. So when you turn 35, when you turn 40, when you turn 45, and on like that, that's when that birthday is when you get that will out and see, do you need to make changes? You want to do this because the loved ones you have will be grieving enough over the loss of you. You don't want to leave a mess behind. Do this right. So after that happy topic, where are you going to take okay. us? Okay, Anonymous in Washington says, Clark, I need some sound advice, words of encouragement, or a good swift kick in the pants. <laughs> I'm not quite sure which one. I'm not good at kicking. <laughs> My 28-year-old son moved back in with us last year after living and teaching for two years in another state. Needless to say, he wasn't making enough to survive. The deal was that he move in with us, work, get his debt paid down, and save money so that he could move out. That's not happening. I found out that he has Which missed... Which parts of it? I found out that he has missed at least one of his truck payments, Ugh. among other bills. His dad and I have told him that if he doesn't get a loan pay, the loan paid, they will come and repossess his truck. It's like talking to a brick wall. I don't want to bail him out, but I also don't want him to lose his truck. What do I do? His dad and I have struggled financially all of our marriage, and we just want better for our kids. How do I help him without enabling him? How do I get him to listen to me? Signed, why won't they listen or parenting adult kids sucks. So as I shared not that long ago, there was a stat that one third of adult children under age 35 are living back with their parents. They, they call them rebound kids or something. Your son's 28. I know a lot of people would say, tough love, he's got to move out. Something's going on here. There's more going on. Not making the payment. Where's the money going? I'm sure your imagination has gone to different places. Why he's got no housing costs, eating your food, and can't make the truck payment and other bills. Something is going on. And it's something um, that involves the help of a professional. I mean, you could, as parents, say, you got to get out there and get on your own and let him sink or swim. And I know that was the traditional answer. I can tell the love you have and the frustration and the frustration for both of you, and you just want your house back and your life back. I'm going to say the craziest thing. One, if you are a member of a religious congregation or a church, you should go for pastoral counseling. That's what they're there for. And see if there are some suggestions. Um, if you're not religious or if that's not a viable option, this may surprise you, but going to a marriage and family therapist is what I'd recommend. At first, maybe for you and your husband, and then later, hopefully, your 28-year-old son will come. With the missed payments and things, my mind goes different places. Something's wrong either psychologically or something else. And so uh, it's not working for you. It's obviously not even working for your 28-year-old son. And that's why I would not delay on this and get that counseling wherever you would get it and figure out a path that works best for your son and for you and your husband. And I wish you the best. And please let me know later how this is going. Alonzo in Illinois says, I was recently released from prison after three years. With your help, my credit score had been at 740. While incarcerated, my credit cards were being used without my knowledge or authorization. What? What? Yep. I believe my roommate got a hold of my personal property and had a shopping spree. 
One card had a $5,000 credit line and sued me for $3,500. That's when I found out about things. Fast forward to my release in 23, I started contacting those institutions about my credit cards after obtaining my report, my credit report. All the accounts are charged off. I am in $25,000 worth of debt. One bank person told me that since I didn't catch it within 90 days that I am now on the hook for it. Tell me this isn't true. Is there anything I can do? My credit score is now 550. <sighs> Alonzo, I'm so glad you're out of prison. I hope that your life is on a very positive path now. And I know this pulls you down. There you were with a solid, great credit score in, your, in the 700s. So now 550? That's hard. Are you liable? Your ability to dispute charges ends in 60 days, not 90. Um, but this is a very unusual situation. And what your liability might be, because you've got this company that sued you for 3500 and they might get a judgment against you, is to see what legal rights you have because the one thing I don't want you to have to do is file bankruptcy and this is way out there and we've we've had lots of situations with an ex uh, girlfriend or boyfriend using cards and mm -hmm. ex spouses using cards and all that kind of stuff your circumstance we've never had we definitely file a police report that's exactly right yeah you get on record with a police report that these were uh, not your charges by an unknown entity. You can't, you can't accuse the roommate because you don't know it was the roommate. But you can say that someone ran up debts as if they're you. I know it's a weird thing to ask you after your unhappy encounters with the police to recommend a police report, but that is one step and then we get to a decision tree and you don't know what's gonna work normally what you would do is you'd hire a consumer lawyer there are specialists who work on consumer law cases that may be able at not too huge a fee to work on your behalf with these credit card companies and try to uh, get the burden relieved from you from these cards I don't know if there's any uh, prison release program that you have been part of that may be able, an advocacy organization or whatever, that may be able to help you, and that potentially would be at no cost. But this is a hard situation, and I can't tell you that the charges are not now considered under the law to be valid charges because they may be because of the period of not being challenged after the 60 days it is a terrible circumstance. Do not let this discourage you. Do not let this keep you from the process of continuing to rebuild your life. And in the worst possible scenario, the result would be a Chapter 7 bankruptcy filing. But that would be the worst possible scenario, and that by itself in a situation like you described, is not the end of the world. This is from Jacob in New Jersey. I will be taking a road trip to camp around my home state of West by God, Virginia this fall. I'm going with my son and a couple of friends, so we need to maximize space in our vehicle beyond the sedans we all have. I was introduced to an app called Turo, which brands itself as being user-friendly and transparent by having prices that include the price of quality insurance. The vehicles are rented out by their owners, so it seems like the car version of Airbnb. I think this is the route that I'm ready to take, no pun intended, on renting a van for this trip. I was wondering if you had heard of this company and what your feedback would be on it. I've been listening daily for over a year now and can't thank you and your team enough for the positive impact you put into the world particularly on this young dad and the effect it'll have on my son as well. Jacob, thank you for those wonderful words you said. And West Virginia is gorgeous. Have you ever been? I have not been to West Virginia. West Virginia really is beautiful. Um, and 
renting from Turo is a great alternative. Uh, my middle brother rents from Turo all the time, and he loves it. We have had an occasional complaint about Turo, like we got complaints about Airbnb, but overall, people's experiences with Turo that they have come to us and that I've read about, that overall, Turo has been a great source and great alternative. And if you got in the Turo and it seemed like it wasn't well-maintained, something like that, because of all the hills in West Virginia and mountains, you would not want a Turo that is not properly maintained and not in good condition. That would be a circumstance where you say, whoa, when you go to pick it up, this is not going to work. But otherwise, I think you could be very happy with it. And I think it'll work great on your vacation. And I hope your son lives a Clark Smart life with his wallet all through the years. And don't forget, we're here for you at ClarkDeals.com and Clark.com around the clock to serve the needs of your wallet and stretch every dollar. So know that we've got that going on for you. We also have, I'm surprised after 30 plus years, how many people don't know that we provide free one-on-one -on -one advice, the Team Clark Consumer Action Center. So we're available to answer your questions, to serve you Monday through Friday. You can see full details about getting that free one-on-one -on -one advice at clark.com slash CAC. Have a great weekend.